Aloha. Aloha. I'm truly delighted to join y'all today, both as a speaker and as a student, and in person. I love our social interactions as we learn together. And my, I mahalo Kamal and the great team enabling us to be here today. And it does take a great team. So pandemics. Pan means all and dim means people. It involves all of the people. Now I'm first going to talk about a path to a pandemic and some of the terms I'll be using. Some viruses are endemic. That means in people all the time. They wander around. They're constantly in the environment <clears throat> being spread. Uh, like there are hundreds of different rhinoviruses that cause colds, not a serious disease, so we just live with it. Influenza virus, though, is endemic, and we don't we take other activities to control it. Now, an outbreak is when you have an unexpected increase in the number of cases of a disease. Like in 2019, the U.S. had eradicated measles in this country. But we had a number of outbreaks in unvaccinated people because it came in with somebody who traveled. And that's an outbreak. Certainly in the live animal markets in Wuhan, China, we had the outbreak of COVID-19 with people who had been in those markets. That very quickly went to an epidemic way beyond that region and involved many more people. And of course, as we know, it went to a pandemic involving the whole world. Now, I also mentioned there the word zoo in a number of these, like an a epizootic or an enzootic. Uh, that means it's in the animals because they have the same types of situations, and that's often related to diseases that impact on us. Now, the characteristics of a pandemic, by the way, most pandemics eventually become endemic, just like influenza has. COVID-19 is on that same path, being around all the time, and that's why you'll probably have to take yearly boosters. That's kind of a circle in that way. A pandemic is global, to begin with. It's usually a new infectious agent, just like COVID-19, or it can be one that's been circulating but hasn't been causing a problem like flu. It causes serious disease, high morbidity and mortality. And the last one is the most important spreads easily person to person worldwide. And COVID-19 certainly does that extremely well. But now there are many viruses that have made it through those first couple of steps. And the best example is the highly virulent avian influenza virus H5N1. It appeared in chickens in uh, Asia almost 20 years ago now. And birds die within three to five days and 50% of the people who got infected, and there were 800 cases, died. A very high, hot virus. These are highly pathogenic, highly virulent. Um, and also, this virus had a very broad host range. It infected lots of different uh, avian species, but also a lot of different mammalian species. So this is one you really look up for. But it did not spread easily person to person. But I'm going to return to that one because I still think it's a major concern. So a lot of people think of pandemics as actually a virus having a passport to any country in the world. And that's a good way to remember it. They do have that. Now, there have been lots of pandemics in the past. So I thought it would be really boring to go through a long list of them. So I chose these, the biggest killers. These have killed the highest number of people in the world. Uh, cholera and bubonic plague are both bacterial, and smallpox and influenza viruses. Now, all of them are old diseases, by the way. You're going to see the dates on the slides. They've been around a very many centuries, so they've been around a long time. So making advances with the, against those viruses, that's quite an accomplishment. So the first one, cholera. Now, it's been responsible for six major pandemics, and it's caused by this little bacteria, Vibrio cholera, and it's kind of cute. It has a little tail or a flagellum, and that enables it to swim around and because it's often found in contaminated water. And as I said, it's been around a long time. But the worst one was the third epidemic in the 1800s um, of all the pandemics that happened, and it's called the Blue Death. 
These people have such profuse watery diarrhea that they get severely dehydrated. And so what happens then is their blood thickens and can't carry the oxygen throughout their body. And they turn blue or cyanotic because of lack of oxygen. And that usually means they're going to die. Now, there was a smart physician that came along, Dr. John Snow, and uh, he was very curious about why people, outbreaks were in certain areas of London. So he went around and tracked every single outbreak. And what he was able to do was to track it back to this broad street pump. People using that were getting it and then infecting other people. And um, the reason being, the Broad Street pump had been contaminated with sewage from people infected with cholera. He shut down the pump. The pandemic subsided. Quite an accomplishment, actually. So this disease right now is really rare in any industrialized country, uh, but it is endemic in some countries in Asia and Africa. In fact, there's a big outbreak in Malawi, Malawi, in Africa, where over a 1,000 people have died during this last year from cholera. So it's not gone. It still causes a fair number of cases uh, and deaths. However, it will not cause a pandemic because of the precautions that have been taken since we learned about it. The treatment is fairly straightforward. You hydrate the person to counter the dehydration, and you give them antibiotics to take care of the organism. But that's not always available in a lot of places. And the most important issue is prevention. This is a totally preventable disease if you have clean water, safe water. But you have to have good sewage treatment systems to do that. And that's where the problem typically is. And that's why I mentioned the swimming, because that's how they get around, too. Now, there are vaccines, but those are only used in areas of the world where it's endemic. They're not used in our country. But this one's basically very much under control and could be eliminated. Okay. Okay, the next one, bubonic plague. Um, this, this is a big killer. Only caused two major pandemics, but 75 to 200 million deaths. And it's caused by an organism called Yersinia pestilence. Pest came from pestilence. So it, it's, a, it's a very impacting disease. Now, this one is called the Black Death. And it killed 30 to 60% of all Europeans uh, during the 1300s. Um, what happens with, in this case is the, is the bacteria goes throughout the body, shuts off the oxygen and damages tissues, and then they be- develop gangrene, which turns black. So it was called Black Death. And they had these huge pits where they had to bury hundreds and hundreds of people. And this was your physician during that time. A little interesting. Um, they, they knew there was, they might need to protect themselves in some way. Uh, this wasn't it, but they didn't know that. They wore long coats. They wore gloves, a hoodie, <laughs> a hat, and this beak-like mask made out of leather. Now, it made, might have made them feel better, but it really wasn't how they were going to protect themselves because the culprits here were rats carrying bubonic plague and their fleas. The fleas would bite the rat and then transmit it to people. And during that time, people had a lot of fleas too. So they would bite the people and go to the next person. So this one was very impacting, uh, but the rat was a source at that point. So they noticed that it particularly was a problem in sailors. Ports and boats had a lot of rats. And so the Scandinavian uh, countries had this death ship because people, when the sailors would come on the shore, a lot of people, including them, would die. And then the ships just sat there because they couldn't leave. So they figured out the need to quarantine the ships. They would make them stay way, way out of the harbor for a month. And if nobody died <laughs> during that time, they could land. And that's what brought that, that uh, disease under control. Now, it's not common anymore, but it's not gone. 
In the last 50 years, we've averaged about seven cases of human plague. It is not endemic in people. It does not circulate in people. Uh, but it is in wild rodents. And so if you, you have, that's the source, in squirrels, rats, prairie dogs. My granddaughter, Audrey Virginia, she worries a lot, of, she lives in Denver, and she worries a lot about her dogs chasing prairie dogs. And she should, because they may have plague. And of course, anything that eats an infected animal might catch it as well. But currently, this is very rare, but it is in zootic in wild rodents everywhere. But there's really no risk of a future pandemic from this one either. Uh, we have minimal cases per year with a few deaths. And again, the treatment is antibiotics for the organism. And you want to isolate them so they don't transmit it to anybody taking care of them. But then this is controlled fairly readily. Now, you can prevent it by reducing rodents, but we aren't going to get rid of them totally. We have them around where I live. Um, so you try to keep them out of contact with you. Now, there are people that do field work, like I did with different species, and they have to wear protection like gloves and flea repellent. And we do have vaccines, but they're not used in the U.S. either because it's just not enough of an issue to warrant that. So this is another one now that's under control. Smallpox. This is one of my favorite diseases, and the fact it's been around just forever. Uh, Ramses V, he had pock marks all along his cheeks and the mummy that they could tell was due to smallpox. It's a devastating disease. It is the biggest killer of all time. 300 to 500 million deaths just in the 20th century. That is huge. Uh, you can see this is a very old virus, and as you can see, a case of smallpox, it's quite, it affects every organ. It's a really serious disease. It was used in, er, as an early bioterrorism agent. The U.S. Calvary used to rub smallpox scabs into the blankets they gave to Native Americans to make them sick so they'd be easier to defeat. Not a pretty story. But again, along came a very smart... English physician. He lived out in the country, Dr. Edward Jenner. And he noticed that milkmaids had beautiful skin, whereas women living in the city had terrible pock marks and were heavily scarred if they'd survived smallpox. He also noticed that the udders of the cows had lesions on them, and the milkmaids, when they'd milk them, they'd get lesions on their hands. And he started thinking, well, maybe there's some connection. He didn't know about viruses at that point, but maybe there's a connection. So what he did, he scraped um, Sarah Nelm's hand where she had the little lesion, and then she scratched, he scratched that onto the skin of an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps. Then he challenged him three times with live smallpox, something that would not be done today. Uh, <laughs> Thankfully, the vaccine worked. <laughs> the child was fine. Uh, but this was really the beginning of our efforts uh, worldwide to eradicate this particular disease. Now, this is what it looks like. Oopsie. How many of y'all have a smallpox scar? Yeah. I taught a class last week, and nobody had it except for me. <laughs> um, yeah, they stopped vaccinating in the U.S. about 52 years ago uh, because we didn't have any problem with it. But I want to mention one thing else about this uh, smallpox vaccine. Remember the outbreaks we've been having with monkeypox? That's the vaccine they used. They're not the same virus, but they're relatives. Monkeypox and smallpox. We use cowpox virus, actually. And so they're related enough that they can offer some protection against monkeypox. So we do still use the vaccine in that way. And this is, to me, one of the greatest announcements ever, eradication of smallpox. The world and its peoples have won freedom from smallpox, no future pandemics. Now, this was possible for a number of reasons, but certainly one is a smallpox virus is a DNA virus. It doesn't change very much. And it only occurs in humans. There's no animal reservoir of this virus. 
Um, it also, we had a great vaccine which offers lifelong immunity. We're still immune. And a world that cooperated. It took the whole world to make this happen. Billions of dollars, many, many years, and a united effort against this particular killer. But it did work. And that, to me, is one of the major findings of the century. Now, so three so far that you were the biggest killers have now really come under control. And then we get to my favorite virus, influenza. The father of medicine described this originally, Hippocrates. We will have this forever. Okay? Um, everybody knows and has heard a lot about the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. It killed 40 to 50 million people in the world. It's still the worst influenza outbreak ever. Um, it killed more people than war-related injuries in World War I. Um, it wasn't because we lacked antibiotics either, because these people died within three to five days. So it was a killer. And um, it, we now know that it was an avian influenza virus of origin. That's where it came from. So... I like this quote. The measure of intelligence is the ability to change. It's true for us as humans. It's also very true for viruses. And influenza A is the champion of change. We have a huge reservoir. Migratory waterfowl have all the known subtypes of influenza viruses. And it usually doesn't bother them. It's been there for millennia. And many different species can be infected with these viruses. So that makes it a special concern. So what's happening right now, it's common, we have, it's endemic, and it's enzootic. It's both in humans and other animal species. So a pandemic is expected from this one at some point. And it, this is a killer virus. A lot of people say, oh, it's just the flu. Hundreds of thousands of people die around the world each year just during a normal flu season. So when you have a pandemic, that shoots up. We do have some treatments, antivirals, but it's, it's a problem. Because one thing, you have to take them early. They're kind of expensive. And in addition, the virus mutates and becomes resistant to them fairly readily. And that's been a big problem with that. So the best thing we have is vaccines. Now, how many have had their flu vaccine? Okay, great. The, really, you need to take, this is particularly important for us at a certain age because we suffer more disease and death from flu. But also, they have a particular vaccine just for us called Flu Zone, or there are several other names too, but it has four times the amount of dead virus in it than the normal vaccine. The reason being because as we age, our immune system wanes, becomes less robust. So they give us a little extra boost. And also, it's very important to take it every year because some years you might not respond. So be sure and take that one. It does reduce disease and death in a great way. And I want to mention that point about vaccines. They don't always prevent infection. The goal of a vaccine is to reduce the severity of disease and reduce the number of deaths. That is the goal with vaccines. Okay, so... When we look at the 1900, since 1900, these are the major pandemics we've had. Three are due to influenza viruses. And, of course, we all know, sadly, HIV hit the world in a heavy way and cost a lot of lives. But now with the drugs that are available, people are able to live reasonably normal lives and a lifespan is normal. Uh, COVID-19. We all know this one. We've lived through it and it's still going. Um, one of the sad things about COVID-19 is the U.S. is number one in the number of cases and the number of deaths in the world due to COVID. That's kind of a disgrace in my view. Uh, we can't let that type of thing happen again. That, that's just not acceptable. So right now, what do we have? A triple-demic. Yeah, that's fun. We have influenza A, two viruses, H3N2 and H1N1 circulating and causing a lot of disease. COVID-19 is still going. We lost eight people last week in Honolulu to this disease. It's not gone. 
Uh, it's reduced, thankfully, due to vaccines, but it's not gone. And then we have one RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. All of these cause more disease and deaths in older people. So we need to be concerned about all three. But RSV is not as commonly talked about as the others. So it was actually not isolated until 1956. And it was from a colony of monkeys being used for scientific research in Washington, D.C. They had runny noses and cough. And then a couple months later, babies in that same area started having respiratory disease, and lo and behold, it was the same virus. So someone got infected and carried it out. Uh, We have a lot better containment for these types of things today. But anyhow, it got established in babies particularly. That's the one you heard the most about. Currently, it's endemic. It's around all the time. It doesn't go away. Uh, The biggest thing uh, in children only under five, they have increased hospitalizations and clinic visits, but they don't have a high number of deaths, thankfully. But it's it's a disease in them. But look at the adults, 65 and older. More hospitalizations and 14,000 deaths per year in the U.S. That's a lot. Uh, This is just now getting some publicity because um, normally they just talk about the the young children rather than the the older adults. We do have some treatments, monoclonal antibodies. This is a special preparation of antibodies directed at the fusion protein of the RSV, which is the virus attachment protein. And they give this prophylactically to babies before they leave the hospital sometimes to be sure they have a little protection before they get exposed. But it's not, it's, it's not as common as some of the other uh, treatments. Prevention, well, we tried, uh, some folks tried to make a vaccine in the 60s. And what happened was when they vaccinated the babies, uh, the opposite happened that they expected. Vaccinated babies got sicker than unvaccinated babies when they got infected with RSV. And two died. So this caused everybody just to back off. We're not going to try this because this is too risky. We, we, they don't know why that happened, but it did happen. But now there's some exciting work going on with Moderna and a messenger RNA vaccine. And it's, gonna, it's designed to go to two groups, pregnant women, because if they get immunized, they can transmit, transfer the antibodies to the baby via the placenta, and so they'll be protected when they're born and older people, people over 60. Um, Those are the two target groups. And the clinical trials were quite encouraging, so I think we'll be seeing this one in the near future as a possibility for ourselves, and I would certainly be one to take it. Now, one of the funny things with RSV, during COVID, we didn't see much. It was kind of gone. Um, and then last fall, and it, it sh- started showing up, and then it just went straight up. So we had a lot of cases, and that's related to the triple demic. Um, why? Why would we have a triple demic at this time um, with all these three viruses just kind of being rampant? Well, I want you to think about what we did during COVID, the public health practices. Washing hands with lots of warm, soapy water. Um, Viruses are inactivated by heat. The soap dissolves the fat coat on these viruses and kills them. And if you use a lot of water, it dilutes whatever's on your hands. Always a good practice, by the way. And, of course, we were doing the physical distancing and mask. But in addition, we weren't going to work. We were working from home. The kids weren't in school. We didn't go to gatherings like weddings and funerals and music concerts. Didn't go out to eat. A lot of isolation, which wasn't pleasant, but we had a lot of isolation. And then, of course, along came the vaccine, the boosters uh, against COVID. So some of the things we thought, we kind of changed what we did at that point. Thank goodness for those. But I want to show you what happened with flu during this time. I worked on flu a long time. I have never, ever seen this before. In 2020... Green means no activity of flu. 
There was virtually no influenza in our country. I have never seen that, ever. Okay. What happened later? 21, we started seeing a little coming back, a little activity increasing across the country. And then this year, it's all red and black. That means high level of activity of influenza. That's a huge change. So public health practices work. <laughs> they work against COVID. They work against flu and RSV. Um, and prevention is clearly always better than treatment. So I think in certain circumstances, we have to d adopt some of these practices just during particularly certain seasons where these viruses are at their height. Uh, but I always thought, I really thought, I was amazed when I saw these results that the others had been so controlled. You want to answer that? <laughs> so let's talk about the future um, of viruses that might cause pandemics. There are a lot of them, okay? Certainly the coronaviruses you're quite familiar with we had MERS and SARS, killed a lot of people, but didn't spread person to person. COVID-19, clearly, distinctly different. Uh, flaviviruses, and of course the coronaviruses, there are hundreds of them in bats. There are lots of coronaviruses out there. Flaviviruses, we've had dengue fever here in Hawaii. People, you're familiar with that. Zika was in the news. A lot of these are mosquito transmitted. Uh, and then the orthomyxoviruses, which are influenza viruses. And this is where I want to bring up the issue about the H5N1 again. Because right now we're having what's called a panzootic of that virus in a lot of animal species. Um, last year in the U.S., 57 million chickens either died or had to be euthanized because of the highly virulent H5N1. That's why eggs are shortage and so expensive. That's really a lot of birds being infected. In addition, a number of wild birds, uh, eagles, um, pelicans, um, certainly migratory waterfowl, all these different birds are having problem with this virus. And this isn't just in the U.S., this is global. In addition, it's shown up in marine mammals. They live very closely to the birds, close proximity to the birds. Um, and also on a mink farm, where it looked like the mink were actually transmitting it to each other. And that's a warning sign. And this is what we call viral chatting, chatter. It's they're going into different species and replicating and spreading to others. Um, this is a problem because the more a virus replicates in different hosts, it can adapt to that host and can mutate along that to help it along the road to infect and spread. So this is one that I think we really have to keep an eye on because this virus does have a broad host range. So if you see something about H5N1, read it. Uh, the other one, paramyxoviruses, these are viruses that come from bats, usually infect farm animals, so it's not a huge problem yet, but it can infect people. And then toga viruses, these are the fevers, typically found in birds, and then transmitted to people by mosquitoes. So what are some of the factors that might be important in their causing disease? Most of them, all of them are zoonotic, able to transfer from the animal to the human. Anything that does that is always going to have the potential. Most of them have big animal reservoirs, like bats for COVID, migratory waterfowl for flu. There are a lot of birds and some of the fever viruses. Also, we're having increased interactions. We have a lot more people, folks, in the world today. And they also are occupying the animal habitats and moving and encroaching into their territory. So that puts you in closer contact between the different species. And also remember, we can give them our viruses too. It's not just a one-way street. Um, but this is a big problem in many ways. A lot of them are spread by the respiratory tract, and that's an easy way to spread. Uh, for example, with influenza, you're spreading virus two days before you show symptoms. That's why it's so hard to control. You may feel fine, but you're out there infecting everybody around you. So that's a big one. The other one is mosquito transmission. 
And global warming is a problem in this regard because as we warm, and we see it over on the big island with bird malaria, as we warm, the mosquitoes move up in altitude. So on the big island where the mountains, the birds are being exposed to avian malaria because the mosquitoes are coming higher. And so it's threatening some of the species there. The big thing that they all have in common is their RNA viruses. And these have high mutation rates. And I'm going to just briefly illustrate how this can happen. And you have to imagine that my head is a virus. Today I'm COVID-19. And this is my spike protein, my hair. looks really nice. Now, any self-respecting virus wants to enter a cell, infect it, and create thousands of new ones and spread to the next person so it survives. But if you've had the COVID vaccine, you make antibodies. And so the next time I come along and try to infect you, you're blocked. And it works. And this vaccine is great. Uh, however, these viruses do mutate. I'm coming back. I have mutated. Okay, now I'm beta, delta, omicron, and the the subvariant of omicron, XBB 1.5. Very catchy title. So now, maybe the antibody won't fit quite as well as it did before, and you can affect me. However, if you had the bivalent booster, it had offered protection against these, particularly against the recent one that's causing so much trouble because it's so highly contagious. So again, you're protected. But coronavirus does have the potential to do something a little more dramatic. It can change totally. I, you can, I don't have the same S protein anymore. And so this antibody would not work at all. Now, how do they do that? Well, they have a different way from influenza. This is COVID-19. And this is the gene that codes for the S protein. But here comes another one. Another coronavirus. It has a different S gene. So what they can do is recombine so that they swap genes. This is called recombination. So they can get a totally new S protein, which is a virus attachment protein. So they have the potential to change dramatically. They are doing this right now, but they haven't changed dramatically yet. Okay. So, have we learned our lesson (laughs) about the power of microbes? I think most people are anticipating that they know that there will be a next pandemic. We are going to have them in the future. Now, how to handle that, we need to conduct surveillance on dangerous viruses. And we actually have identified hot spots around the world where we think the likelihood would be greater for transmission and disease outbreaks with these viruses and also advanced vaccine research. Uh, We've made leaps and bounds the last few years, but we're gonna need to make even more leaps and bounds. Be prepared to respond quickly. Pandemics wait for no one. They are quick. It's like a fire in a dry field. And we, uh, sadly in the US, did not respond as quickly as needed. And you have to build trust in vaccines. We actually have some of the best vaccines ever. But if nobody takes them, then they don't work. And I try to encourage people, I take vaccines, certainly to help myself, but also to help other people be better and have better health and not get infected. So those are really important points that we have to do. Now, after that news, (laughs) I wanna talk about the good news. There is good news. Messenger RNA vaccines. That's a fantastic advance. 
Now, it's not new to us as scientists because the research has been going on almost 40 years on this molecule and how it could be used. Um, but it was the first time this technique had been used in people in a wide scale using messenger RNA vaccines. Um, and what was amazing to me, because of the research that had been done before, it only took one year to get through all the clinical trials and the tests needed for us to take it. That is really great. It typically takes about one to four, four to ten years for a vaccine to come to market. And a lot of times they don't change them because of that. It takes too much work. But this one really moved fast in that regard. And I want to applaud this woman. She's my vaccine hero. She's an immigrant from Hungary. She spent 40 years studying messenger RNA. She figured out the two keys that needed to be done to make it work as a vaccine. So I applaud her for her efforts. So messenger RNA, we make it all the time in our cells. It's normal. Okay, messenger RNA is what leads to the proteins that are produced in our cells, and we need those for structure and function of cells. So it's a normal molecule. It's a very short-lived molecule, only a few days. And then a new one comes in, and you make new proteins and stuff. So how does that relate to the vaccine? Well, we have the virus. In this day and age, we can sequence the entire genome of a virus within a couple of days. It's unbelievable. Genetic sequencing has gotten faster, cheaper, and more widely available. So now we've got the genetic sequence of this virus. Well, we're only interested in the virus attachment gene. So we take that for the spike protein, because that's the virus attachment protein, and we make it a messenger RNA. The virus is gone, by the way. You don't deal with the virus anymore. I want, all you want is a sequence. So you take that sequence of, and you make a messenger RNA in the laboratory to match it. Okay? And since messenger RNA is very short-lived, uh, one, one of the changes she made was to tweak it a little bit so it'd stay around for at least a couple weeks. So it would make more. And also then surround it with lipid nanoparticles. It has to be protected. But so when you get it in your arm, those lipid nanoparticles help fuse with the cell membrane and kind of spits the messenger RNA into your cells. And then the cell makes the messenger RNA for the S protein. It makes the protein. Uh, that protein goes to the surface of the cell because that's the way it functions. Your immune system sees it, says that's foreign, and you produce antibodies and cell-mediated immunity to it. And the fact that it lasts a little bit longer is great because we actually have, probably have more antibodies to the S protein than somebody who was, then was infected because you're really focusing the immune response on that one protein. So it's really, really impressive. So advantages? Well, big one's not having to deal with the virus. If you've ever gone to a place where they produce vaccines with viruses, they have to grow the virus in you know, huge fats or immunated chicken eggs for flu. And um, it's very expensive. It has the risk of infection, dealing with large amounts of virus. Then you have to purify it, then inactivate it. And this is a very expensive and requires big facilities to do it. There is no concern about DNA integration, and this was a conspiracy theory that was put forward originally. Messenger RNA does not have that function or capacity, so that really is not a big concern. You don't have to inactivate or treat it. It's just a you know, piece of messenger RNA, like you do with the viral vaccines. That's another important step. Efficacy. Well, her, her addition of stabilizing the messenger and RNA for longer periods of time so it's really helpful in inducing a better immune response. Synthesis. This is really neat. Messenger RNA can be quickly designed, changed, and scaled up. It's done in a laboratory. It's, it's really straightforward. Um, it is not simple as that, but it really is really, really easy to do compared to growing liters and liters of virus. It, you can use it for a lot of different pathogens. And the cost is lower. 
than the other platforms because you don't need some of these huge facilities that you have for vaccine for viruses typically. But the biggie, it's 95% effective in inducing protective antibodies. That's a great vaccine. That's really impressive uh, and one to be proud of. Now, it does have a few disadvantages. The low temperature storage is because mRNA is so sensitive. You have to keep it at very low temperatures until you use it. Uh, that is one. Two injections are needed plus boosters. We've all, I've had three boosters now. Um, and I think you'll be getting one every year because, as I said, I think it's be, becoming endemic. We have a lot of unvaccinated people in the world, and um, so it's still circulating and will continue to do so for a while. Typically, they have mild reactions. There is one serious one, myocarditis, particularly in young males for some reason. Not exactly sure why at this point, uh, but that one is a serious one, but it's very rare. Now, it's interesting when my family got vaccinated, Bill and I had absolutely no problems with the vaccine. Our grandchildren took to their beds for two days. And it's probably because they have a much more robust immune system than we do. Um, and when that happens, sometimes you produce cytokines, which are normal chemicals in our bodies. But they can make you feel bad. And so it was really interesting that the older people seem to have not as much of a problem. So I said, I just told the grandkids, it's a many, one of the many advantages of being older. <laughs> So we're going to use it for other viruses. Um, certainly, it's already being used in clinical trials against Ebola. Uh, and the results look quite interesting and, improve, and uh, looks like it's going to work for that. Um, I'm really anxious to have it used for influenza. Remember I mentioned it's, we grow the virus in the embryo age chicken eggs? Well, that can be a problem if you have H5N1 around. You don't have the eggs. So advances in this regard will help in lots of different ways, I think. Also, it's really exciting to see what's happening with melanoma. They're using messenger RNA vaccines to treat melanoma, and those results are also very encouraging. And certainly, people that lack certain proteins, like cystic fibrosis, maybe you could give them this and help them make the protein. That might not be a long-term fix, but it could help in reducing symptoms and damage that they experience. So I think, really, that the future is quite bright with this. So the goal is to be well prepared to reduce disease and death quickly in the next pandemic. And I love this uh, quote, learn from yesterday, the past, live for today, the present, hope for tomorrow. I have hope for tomorrow, and I wish you good health. Mahalo for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Virginia. That was really wonderful. Do we have any questions from our audience here? The only bad question is one which is not asked. <laughs> <laughs> While we're... Oh. Booster uh, coming up in this fall, this spring. Well, we, we will have a booster offered. Right now, it would probably be the same one because it does protect against the more recent variants. Um, there are two in the bivalent, and the original, and one of the variants. So, if it changes much during the coming year, they'll make a new one. But I think we will all be. Um, asked to take boosters, one probably one booster next year. You'll probably take one this fall. <laughs> yeah, every year, just like flu. Mm -hmm. And you can get them together. That's not a problem. You can take. I took both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, have antibiotics been overused so that they are not as effective in killing the superbugs? Antibodies or antibiotics? Antibiotics. Yeah, antibiotics. Uh, I only talked about viruses today, but 
there's certainly a, a major concern about antibiotic resistant organisms. And one organism that we don't talk a lot about, but it's TB. Difficult to treat. In Africa, they have some strains that are just simply terminal. And so there's a lot of concern about the antibiotic resistance, and there's a lot of work going on trying to develop new approaches to uh, getting rid of bacteria because so many are getting resistant. And we see it here with MRSA, methicillin-resistant organisms. Um, and so, that, yeah, that's a, that's a huge problem and one we have to be very attentive to. Uh, and are there any comments on norovirus, which is on the rise? The norovirus, that's the one that often occurs on um, cruise ships. It causes uh, diarrhea, easily transmitted in a confined population. Um, so, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> We've had outbreaks in the nursing homes as well yeah. of norovirus. Yeah. It's been quite devastating there. Yeah, it's, it's anything that's uh, fecally can, uh, transmitted yeah. it's in, in an environment where you have a lot of people in close contact, it's really hard mm -hmm. to always clean up sufficiently to get rid of them. Some of these are kind of hardy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions here? Virginia, as we all know, the uh, COVID virus, or excuse me, the COVID vaccine has become a a very serious political issue over the last three years. Uh, what can we in this room do to help people understand that this is necessary if we're going to um, avert future pandemics? Yeah, that's really an important activity. And some you will never convince, I have to admit. I've run into many of those. Uh, what I try to do is I listen carefully to the people ask them questions about why they think that, try to give them resources that might counter some of the concerns they have. Once you poo-poo their ideas, they aren't listening to you anymore. But if you can listen, truly listen to where their fears are coming from. Some of the people, when the vaccine appeared, it was a new approach. There were valid fears. Those, those I actually fully understood. Uh, the ones with the conspiracy theories, um, the political viruses don't care what party you belong to. They really don't. They'll take everybody. Um, and those type the anti-vaxxers, um, some of those you, you, you probably just have to grit your teeth and, and say that, well, I have a very different view of that. Uh, and I'm taking, it, uh, I'm taking it to protect myself, but also to protect you. But also, physicians can play a big role in trying to uh, listen to people and talk to them about their fears and what they actually think is a fear. Like one of the conspiracy theories was if you get vaccinated, you're going to become magnetic and the silverware will stick to you at the dinner table. I mean, some of them are so ludicrous, but yet they get a lot of coverage on social media. And probably those of us that support vaccines have not been as active on social media as we need to be to counter some of this to give the facts. But when you're talking to somebody who's afraid for some reason, I do think it's important to understand why they're afraid. Then maybe you can help them find some information that would counter it. And then, as I said, some of them you're just gonna have to grit your teeth and, and you know, the number of deaths in unvaccinated people is 10 to 20 times higher than those in vaccinated people with COVID. So, you're doing your part if you get the vaccine, and that's the best we can do and trying to help others. But um, some of them, those are the people that are going to be likely to die. They're going to have serious illness and deaths at a higher rate. So you try to tell them that and hope that they listen. The next three questions are actually related to kind of what you already covered. But this question, how do we depoliticize vaccines? so that vaccination rates in the U.S. become higher for the next pandemic? Well, it is politicized right now. You can look at the data on the different parties <laughs> that we have the two. Um, and that's very unfortunate, because as I said, any virologist will tell you that virus doesn't care. Yeah. 
What, what party you belong to. Um, it, there's nothing political about this. This became political because of certain individuals and their stance on it. Um, it should never have become political. And if you want to see a contrast, I give a talk on polio. Hmm. That was a time when the vaccine brought the nation together. Y'all remember getting your polio, either shot or the sugar cube? The whole nation came together. Do you know all the vaccine trials against polio were based on public support and finance? No drug company, no federal money. And it was all done by a lot of volunteers. They used pen and paper to write down the results because there were no computers. But everybody felt so strongly about the fact that we had gotten a vaccine that would protect our children and ourselves, but the children in particular, that it brought everybody together through the March of Dimes. Everybody gave, even if you could only give a dime. So it's utter contrast in what's happened today. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of broken today, I have to admit. It's kind of discouraging in a lot of ways. All of us struggle with this. But we have to keep working at it. Um, there's no political reason to think uh, a vaccine is good or bad. Just look at the data. As I said, 10 to 20 times higher death rate in people who are unvaccinated than vaccinated folks against COVID. Those are the data. Okay. Um, I think it was the 2020 uh, spring session like we have now uh, that you um, talked about COVID when it was just starting out. And I think there is a discussion that um, hopefully this would turn out to be like some of the other viruses and it could be contained. And I don't think at that point anybody imagined that it would become a pandemic. What caused that to happen? Now, I, I know about, you know, we just talked about people not wanting to do vaccines, but globally, what is it, do you think? What are there some of the reasons that it turned out to be so much more catastrophic than we thought it would be back three years ago? Well, virologists thought it would be. I will say that. We had warnings with MERS and SARS. Those were both coronaviruses. And they came from bats and infected people and killed a lot of people. They did not go on and go person to person. And so we had a warning that coronaviruses could be particularly a problem. And in the case of COVID-19, it happens to be a variant or a mutant that transmits really well in people. And then when you go to a live animal market and never go to live animal markets, that's a cesspool of viruses there in different species, they're killing the, bir- the, the animals and there's blood and... and, and You know, people, thousands of people are walking by. So you have a perfect setup for infecting a lot of people. And if any virus in there is able to transmit person to person, it has a good chance. So that one just took off because it had that ability. And then we travel. We all move around. This was during one of the Chinese New Year's celebrations and people were going all over the place. And then people just are moving viruses Viruses don't need visas or passports. Uh, They just come on in. And so the world is much more connected now. So you have to keep not only your next door neighbor healthy, you have to keep your global neighbor healthy. Because we share viruses and we share infectious diseases. Uh, So that's why I made the point with smallpox vaccination. That was a world that cooperated we need to be very careful about maintaining our relationships with other countries, particularly if there are hotspots for virus activity, so that we know when something's happening and we can track it and hopefully react earlier. I think virologists were upset right at the beginning of that because we'd seen Mars, SARS and MERS. So we thought they had potential. Does Hawaii have a preventive advantage against flu because of our sunshine and clean air? Well, there are lots of advantages of Hawaii. (laughs) And the clean air and the sunshine. Viruses don't like sunshine, by the way. That's heat. Um, But the other advantage we have in some ways is uh, we don't have a lot of migratory birds 
to introduce any influenza viruses into our bird populations. Uh, we have very few, so we don't have, we, we walk, where's the wood? Uh, we have not had any problem with H5N1, whereas the rest of the U.S. is having big problems. Of course, the challenge is if it comes in via people or via um, pet birds. <laughs> but we do have a very special uh, place here in, in many, many ways, as I said. But a lot of this is because we don't have a lot of migrants, migratory birds. <clears throat> is the uh, origin of COVID-19 pretty much settled? And uh, if so, why? The 1918? No, COVID-19. COVID. Oh, COVID-19, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, Where did well, it to me it's settled. Okay. <laughs> I see Mother Nature do this all the time with influenza virus, particularly in live animal markets. Um, so it's not surprising at all to me that it would emerge out of a live animal market. You're mixing all these different species in cages and the people are walking by being exposed. It's a perfect place to transmit viruses among species. And so if you get it into other species and it keeps cycling, you have a greater risk of you know, it becoming able to spread in people. And just remember in the markets, those people, they go back to their farms and take those cages they spread it that way. So, I mean, yeah, I don't have, I have no concern about it being from a, a live animal market and an animal population. I know a lot of people say, well, it came from the lab in Wuhan that was studying these viruses. Um, it's quite different from that one. And we know they exist in nature. There are hundreds of them in bats. Uh, so we know they're out there. So, no, from my perspective, it's very clear as to how it came in via Mother Nature being exposed that way um, and not by a laboratory problem. Okay. If you have less side effects from vaccines, is that an indication that your immune response is lower? No, people worry about that. It's usually good enough, but uh, young people just are robust, yeah. and so they over-respond sometimes. Uh, uh, we all probably have good antibodies after our vaccines, but you do need to take them regularly just to give yourself a little boost. You don't want to let it wane to too much. Uh, actually, the influenza vaccine is predicted to last for two years if the virus doesn't change. But that's not necessarily a good thing because maybe one year you won't respond. So you need to be sure you take them regularly. But, yeah, a lot of people worry about that, and I... I counsel my grandchildren, well, it just means it's working. And I said, but mine's working too. I'm just better. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions from our live audience? Uh, you had mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that the U.S. had the most cases and most deaths from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So what can we do next time so that we don't have that distinction? What, what do you think were the leading causes of why were we the, the leader in cases and deaths? Yeah, we delayed. It was first, you know, we had a president who was thinking, it's no big deal, we don't need to worry about it, we'll have it controlled by next year. Mm -mm. No, the signs were there. So we have to react more quickly to warn people about this. That has to come out of the surveillance that we look in all these areas and we have relations with other countries and they tell us when they have a problem so that we can immediately start acting. And I think we're going to have to stockpile potential vaccines, um, the ones we see that are most likely, so that we could start immediately doing it. And there, there's an H5N1 messenger RNA that they're testing. Um, and so I think we can, and we can more easily do that with messenger RNA. That's another advantage. So I think we'll have to stockpile some vaccines. We have to do really good communication, particularly on social media, because people are reading a lot of times stuff that's just crap. You know, it's just terrible. And so we have to counter that with good information in a consistent manner to, so people are well informed about their risk. And then, as I said, build trust in the vaccines that we can offer them. But we should not be number one, not in that regard. And that was really, that cost lives. That was terrible. I don't think we've ever been number one in that regard. 
But we can react more quickly and more effectively in the future, I believe. And I think the messenger RNA vaccines will be a, a tool that enable us to get ready before it hits. And we'll see it right off if we do good surveillance and we'll act. And I think that'll prevent it. I want to be number 516. <laughs> Virginia, could you comment on the potential for ever having a pandemic for something like Ebola or Hunter virus or things like that? Well, Ebola is interesting, and it's a scary virus. I mean, it, it's a big killer. Um, but I don't worry as much about Ebola. I do worry about epidemics from it, because we have them right, right now in Africa. Um, but if somebody has Ebola, you know it. They're very, very ill. Uh, they're, they're bleeding. They're just, it's, just, it's very obvious if somebody has Ebola. So, and they don't put out a lot of virus um, by themselves um, before, well, until they get really, really sick. So that's a con good containment issue. You can contain them and isolate them at that point. The reason Ebola spreads in a lot of African countries is culture. Just like the live animal markets are culture cultural because they want to be sure the meat's fresh. Well, in Africa, it's a sign of respect. When somebody dies, that you evacuate the abdominal cavity of the organs and everything. And what happens then, the virus is in the blood. And so it infects other people and spreads that way. And then they can infect others. Um, but I think we're well equipped to recognize Ebola when it happens and, and isolate people. Uh, we don't have the greatest treatments still. We hydrate and do things like supportive care. But I think the messenger RNA vaccine, using that in endemic areas, will help. So I don't worry as much about the ones where they don't put out much virus until they're really sick, because we know then that they're sick. It's the, one, the sneaky ones like flu. You're putting out virus before you know you're sick. So it's, it is interesting. That's, uh, Ebola is one I hope that we can help reduce the epidemics that they're experiencing in Africa. Do we have any more questions from our live audience? I don't see any more questions online, except Renee says, great to have you back, Virginia. Oh, mahalo. Love you.